Okay, DNA. Why are we talking about DNA? If you think this is tough on your end, think about it from my end. Why are we talking about DNA? It's because of the structure of the DNA molecule itself. That's why we have people who are specialists in genetics looking at this thing very carefully because there's been a lot of controversy lately about DNA. Where did it come from? Why is it, why is it built and structured that way? And the man who's most credited with discovering the structure of the DNA double helix, a guy called Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize with Watson and a few other people who should have been participants in the Nobel Prize ceremony. Francis Crick had this idea that he defended called directed panspermia, which sounds vulgar, but it's not. Directed panspermia means that Crick, looking at the DNA double helix, was certain that it could not have come from the Earth, that there was no way for DNA to evolve naturally from Earth's basic components. There was no way for the amino acids to have formed. There was no way for the double helix to have formed as a, as a, as a product of natural evolution. One of the examples usually given is like, if you take a bunch of rocks and you put them in a box and shake the box really hard, you're expecting a Chevrolet to roll out. That's the degree of complexity between one thing and the other. So he believed that DNA did not come from the Earth naturally. And then his corollary to that was, it came from someplace else, from some other place in the universe. But then he went one step further. A lot of scientists could kind of go along with this to a certain point. Maybe something came in on an asteroid, a meteorite, something hit the Earth, um, you know, a microbe of some kind from someplace else. Doesn't really answer the question, because then where did that microbe come from? But anyway. But Crick went one step further and he said, no, this was directed. So panspermia is the idea that the genetic code was just sort of seeded all over the place, all over the earth. But Crick's second part of this equation is it was directed. Something intelligent put it here. Something intelligent dropped the DNA molecule or the RNA molecule, which is the messenger form dropped it onto the planet, and then it started to reproduce using the, the chemicals that were available. Then a couple of scientists in Kazakhstan, and this is all in Secret Machines Man, so if you want to look at the details and the citations and the footnotes, it's all there. A couple of scientists in Kazakhstan had a unique take to all of this. They kind of figured out directed panspermia was the way to go. But what they did is they said, wait a minute, if you look at the structure of the DNA molecule, the DNA molecule has start and stop codes. There's actually a way to break up different groups of genetic information from the next group. The, the amino acids are separated on the DNA helix by something called a stop code. The scientists said, that doesn't exist in nature either. There's no such thing as a stop code in nature. It's actually zero. What the DNA code has is zero. In other words, like a period, a full stop between to separate these things, to separate the acids from each other. And it's the same codon. It's only one codon. It's not like different codons for different things. There's one codon in the DNA molecule. That's stop. That means stop. That means that's the end of this acid. That's the beginning of the next one. That's weird, because we didn't even know there was such a thing as zero until about 500 years ago. Our mathematical systems until then did not have a zero. 
Look at Roman numerals. Look at any number system that existed up until about the time the Aztecs developed zero and the time India developed zero. Roughly about the same time, but on different sides of the earth. They came up with this idea of zero. There should be a placeholder. So we can do 10, 100, 1,000, etc. There was no zero until comparatively recently, and yet there's a zero that's baked into the DNA molecule. So the Kazakh guys went, whoa, what does this mean? Right? This is the wow signal in the DNA code. We have found evidence that something intelligent built the DNA molecule. Doesn't that go all the way back now to Sumer and human beings as creations of something else? Isn't this the same concept that we knew instinctively existed? So the ancient ideas about the structure of life are reprised now in modern genetics. Here's the double helix that I'm talking about. You see it's a ladder shape. There's two sides. That's DNA. If there's only one side, it's RNA. There are 64 codons in DNA. You can see the stop codes down on the uh, right side of your screen in red. Stop, stop. Those are the stop. Those are the zeros that separate one, one from another. Very important. Without that, you'd be reading gibberish. It'd be like reading uh, War and Peace, but without punctuation. 64, hex 64 codons are reprised in 64 hexagrams, for instance, of the I Ching in, in ancient China. Same arrangement, same structure, identical, right? So you, now you have 64 hexagrams. If you study Chinese religion or Chinese mysticism, or if you're just a new age kind of person, you know about the I Ching. So there it is, the 64 codons can be related one by one, one to one, to the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. Now why is that important? Well, somebody called Leibniz, back a couple hundred years ago, a mathematician, a famous mathematician and scholar, he was fascinated by the I Ching because he saw it as a mathematical structure. So he came at it from the math, and others are coming at it from genetics. And the Chinese just came at it on their own. And you have basically this idea that the number 64 in co combinations of three codes each, three times three, are going to give you the 64, three here and three there. You're going to get 64 different types of figures. And each of these figures represents the motion of something traveling through our consciousness. But don't take my word for it. We can look at the double helix in ancient art going back to Sumer, finding it in China. This is a depiction of the creation of the world that was made long before DNA was discovered. We have a god and a goddess who are the parents of humanity, represented by a double helix. And in this case, you have the stars, especially of the the Big Dipper, which, called, which is called the Northern Chariot in Chinese. And the god and goddess are oddly holding what appear to be Masonic implements, the compass and the square. But this was before Freemasonry was invented or developed. So there it is in China. And then again, a bit more licentiously in India. And why is this all important? Because the double helix, aside from DNA, the double helix does not exist in nature. There is no natural formation of a double helix. You may find a helix, but you won't find a double helix. And yet, for some reason, we depict double helixes all around the world, and we associate them with the gods, goddesses, and creation. Long before Watson and Crick, in the 1960s, discovered the DNA structure of the double helix. There it is in the Garden of Eden, once again. So what does all this mean? I don't know. Why are you asking me? What does all this mean? It comes down to consciousness. How would we know about the double helix? How would we know about the 64 possible combinations? How would we know about all of these things? if it wasn't locked in here somewhere, if it wasn't part of our consciousness. The problem with it is the problem of consciousness. 
The problem of defining this really clearly is because we don't know how to define consciousness. There's a huge controversy over this, and it centers around this idea. Is consciousness, as some people like David Chalmers and other people have, have insisted, is consciousness an emergent property of the brain? In other words, without the brain, there is no consciousness. And the more highly developed our brain is, the more highly developed our consciousness is. Take away the brain, consciousness dies. That's the, that's the mechanistic, mechanical sort of view of consciousness, that without the brain, there isn't any. There's some problems with that, because it assumes that consciousness dies when the brain dies. But that's a little like saying, if my radio is broken, the radio station's not transmitting anymore, right? So you can make an argument that the brain is more like a radio receiver than it is a producer of consciousness. And this war between these two points of view is taking place. It's raging in neurobiology now and in consciousness studies. There's a neurobiological approach that says consciousness comes from the, the actions of cells in your brain that the neurons are communicating with each other, we can change that, we can arrange it, we can affect it, and that will affect consciousness. There's the idea that the visual sense and verbal abilities are not connected necessarily. There's a very strong idea that vision is the most important one of our senses. And that was held by Crick and Watson, the guys who discovered the DNA double helix, but also by Rene Descartes, the famous French philosopher who said, I think, therefore I am, um, he, they believe that vision held the key to consciousness, that, if, that the, the, the whole structure of the eye and what happened between the external field, the eye, and the brain was the royal road to understanding consciousness. We'll get to this in a second because it's relevant to the UFO phenomenon. Then there's neural correlates of consciousness. In other words, certain types of neurons produce certain types of consciousness. If we affect a neuron in a certain way, consciousness changes. And then there's neurogenetic correlates of consciousness. And that goes even deeper by saying there's a DNA component to consciousness that at a certain level, at a sub-sub-microscopic level, down at the Planck scale, where quantum mechanics happens, that there is a connection between the DNA molecule and consciousness. That's the key part of all of this. This is a picture for those of you who are still awake. This is a um, picture of the neurons and how that works, and you're going to see all of that stuff. You all know this from high school biology, I'm sure. Those of you who remember high school biology, for me it was like 50 years ago. But that's just to help remember, remind you of what that is. So why neurobiology? Let's look at a quote by a friend of Jacques Vallée, Aimé Michel. Aimé Michel said, you can read it for yourself, but I'll just say it anyway. No progress can be made in our knowledge of UFOs without changing man's brain. And I'm talking about a biological change, not just a spiritual or psychic change. Think about that. We have to change our brains to understand the UFO. That means all of us have that capability. We don't need to be scientists or military people or work in the Pentagon. If we're able to change our brains, we can understand the UFO. Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan, a very famous person who was central in some of the remote viewing experiments going back to SRI back in the day, back in the 1960s. Jacques Vallée knew him. There's another guy here, Russell Targ, who knew him. You guys are really, really lucky because you have Jacques Vallée and Russell Targ here talking, giving presentations. That's pretty rare. I've written about these guys like 20 years ago. Never expected one day I would meet them and talk to them. They're here. Don't, you know, lose this opportunity from seeing these icons. Ingo Swan said, most surprisingly, one might think ufologists would consider mental processes of extraterrestrials since they are so energetically involved with extraterrestrial equipment and technology. So here's the scientists looking at UFOs, but they're just kind of not thinking about the consciousness aspect. And Swan is complaining that nobody will touch psi, which is the, the, the study of paranormal phenomena, psychic research, with a 10-foot pole. 
although some psychologists studying abduction phenomena have begun to notice the telepathic factor. Well, that's true, isn't it? Virtually everyone that's had an abductee experience reports communications taking place through telepathy. That has two important correlates. If we talk about telepathy, number one, we're talking about consciousness, obviously. But number two, we have to make an assumption that these, whatever they are, these non-humans, have a way of communicating with us that's unique to them, but is also potential in us. Descartes, this is from Descartes, he was trying to figure out how the eye works because he felt that the eye had the connection to consciousness. And to go quickly through this, we're talking about, for instance, night vision. You can see that an owl has binocular vision very, very strong at night. Certain types of animals, certain types of creatures are built to see at night and others during the day. And owls have these huge eyes. And if you look at birds' eyes, they kind of look like that. That's a bird blinking. But if I didn't tell you it was a bird, you might have made another assumption. This is something called the psyoptic ball. It looks pretty familiar. But it's actually a device that will enable an eye or a lens to rotate completely within a fixed place. And that was developed hundreds of years ago. What does that remind you of? So when we talk about the typical alien, the archetypal gray alien, we always talk about the fact that they have these huge, big black eyes. That should be a signal to us that if it had developed on this planet, it was developed to live only at night, to hunt at night, to walk at night, to live at night. The large eyes would not permit something like that to see very well in daylight unless they had really great sunglasses. That kind of an eye is developed for night vision. Now, it could be vision on this planet at night. It could be vision in space. It could be a lot of different things. But it seems to be telling us that it sees at night. So you have to ask yourself, there's a lot of different weird things taking place within human consciousness and the development of the human being. We have to ask ourselves, are humans secret machines themselves? Are we approaching the point in our research, in our development, that we're actually becoming the aliens that we think we see. Lauren Isley, another famous uh, writer on science that I quote a lot in the book, says, perhaps Homo sapiens, that's us, the wise, is himself only a mechanism in a parasitic cycle. This is very down for Isley. An instrument for the transference of a more invulnerable and heartless vision of himself. You'll hear people talking at this conference about artificial intelligence. Is artificial intelligence dangerous? Is it an existential threat? Well, yeah, potentially, of course it is. Why wouldn't it be, right? And Isley is here warning us that we're getting to the point where the development of our machines will eventually replace us, that we're developing these machines because we're trying to get off planet, because we're trying to do things that our normal human bodies cannot do. And in the process, we may be losing something. So at the Planck scale, which is down very, 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 very tiny, this is where physics gets spooky, where biology meets consciousness. I'm gonna go through this quickly because we're running out of time. But microtubules is the key to this idea of consciousness as being a quantum effect. Uh, scientists called uh, Penrose, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff have written a lot of papers and have been criticized in the past for believing that a quantum effect can happen inside the brain because the brain is warm and wet and you need something really cold and really dry. Well, just recently they proved that photosynthesis in plants is a quantum effect. And if that is true, and it is, then that means that quantum effects can happen in, happen in the brain, can happen in a place that's warm and wet, that maybe not as as cold and dry as we've been expected to believe, that quantum effects are possible at different types of temperatures and humidities. These are microtubules. I won't go into all the detail. DNA and microtubules. The microtubules are, are essential for replication of the DNA molecule, but they're also present in the brain, 
as building the neurons and as acting in between the neurons and communicating information. The microtubules are so small, they exist at the Planck scale. Quantum mechanics, the double slit experiment. You guys are really in for a treat. No, you're not. This is the double slit, this is the very famous experiment. Again, I won't go into it in too much detail, but this is the thing that really put quantum mechanics on the map because if they fire an electron through that screen um, one at a time, um, you know, it hits the screen, you're expecting it to make a, a straight line on the screen and back, right? But when you get interference patterns, that seems to indicate that light is not a particle, it must be a wave, that the waves are interfering with each other and giving an interference pattern on the back of the screen. Okay, so light is a wave then, right? Well, no, because if you put a sensor at that middle screen and you measure the particles as they go through, they're particles, they're not waves, and everything changes. That when you observe an effect, you've changed the effect. That observer phenomenon is critical to understanding quantum mechanics. Do observers change the event that we're observing? If that's true, that has tremendous implications for the UFO phenomenon as well. Um, I'm not gonna go into wave particle duality. It's a collapse of the wave function. You've heard that a lot. That means when a wave then becomes a particle because you've measured it. If you're not measuring it, light is a wave. Once you start to measure it, it becomes a particle. What does that mean, right? So why is this relevant? because this is the place where physics and biology coincide, at that infinitesimally small unit of measurement we call the Planck scale. And where physics and biology coincide, that's when you have consciousness. And I mentioned Hameroff and Penrose. So you're gonna hear a lot about things like non-locality, entanglement, as we said, observation, its influence on events, but that's the type of phenomena we associate with ESP, with telekinesis, and things of that nature. We have a hard time scientifically to prove the existence of ESP and telekinesis and all this other phenomenon unless we try to introduce quantum effects, in which case we can kind of come up with explanations that kind of make sense for that. But it's important because these are the types of communications that abductees report when they're in contact with the other. They refer reference telekinesis and telepathy and all of these other things, weird psychological phenomenon as well. So what does that mean? Here's our friend. We talk about alien phenotypes. That's like from anthropology, but what it means is you look at the alien, how does it look? What can we deduce about the alien from its appearance? And we're gonna use the gray because that seems to be like your typical Inex in inescapable kind of alien. Okay, the gray has large eyes, no ears, a small mouth, no genitalia, no hair, no nose, no nose, no nose. So what do these characteristics imply? Well, large eyes for seeing in the night or in the dark, as we mentioned. The visual sense to this gray is more important than hearing or smelling because there are no ears and no nose or a vestigial nose. This indicates that consciousness for an alien is different than it is for us. If, that, if the sensory apparatus is completely different, their way of thinking is different, their priorities are different, the way they're gonna react with us is not going to be predictable. No ears and a small mouth communication by voice is not indicated. Well, we know that because they seem to communicate only through telepathy. No genitalia, they do not reproduce sexually, if they reproduce at all. What does that mean? No hair. There's an indifference to temperature, humidity, the things that we grow hair for. No nose means respiration is not indicated. They're not breathing air the way we are. And in many cases, the absence of knees is noted. Aliens have no knees. Isn't that weird? The gray aliens don't walk the way we do. They don't seem to have a knee. This is interesting because in ancient Jewish mysticism, the angels have no knees. That's a peculiarity of Jewish mysticism. No one knows why that's in there, but they say angels have no knees. And the explanation is, well, that's because they're always standing glorifying God. I don't think the grays are doing that. It's just a, a hinge, a hint, a hinge, a hunch, something. So. 
maybe we're not talking about something that we could understand. This phenotype, the typical gray alien, indicates a being that does not communicate with speech but with some form of telepathy. Their seeming fascination with our sexual reproduction may be because of the lack of their reprodu rep uh, reproductive organs. And maybe they can't figure out what that's for, or they're still trying to figure that out. But all the other characteristics imply a non-organic being. It implies a machine. It implies a machine. Compared to humans, the greys seem to be more like machines than they do like organic beings or creatures. C.D.B. Bryan was a guy who wrote a number of books on this phenomenon. He observed a lot of people at UFO conferences like this. And he wrote, abductees see no eating quarters, sleeping quarters, no food or drink aboard the craft. A human-like figure which is really very, very different. They don't appear to breathe or ingest food or water. And somebody from the audience remarks, everything you describe sounds more like machinery than biology. And now we're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about cyborgs. We started talking about cyborgs back in 1960. This idea that humans and machines can kind of interface to the point where we'll have machines in our body taking care of things, especially during space travel where we're going to need extra capabilities. I mean, I wear glasses, which makes me a cyborg. Seriously, any kind of machine that enhances your, your abilities, a pacemaker, for instance, uh, artificial limbs, these are all things that would be considered cyborgian. This means that we're at the threshold of becoming those very aliens that we've been talking about. With artificial intelligence, robotics, space travel, with our new forms of, um, uh, of interstellar craft that we've been developing, reusable rockets and all the rest of it, even drone technology, we're getting closer and closer and closer to what we think an alien technology is, to what we think the aliens are. It could be that in the next 20 years we're going to cross that threshold and we won't be able to tell them from us. It could be that we're getting that close. Which brings us to the last volume of the trilogy, which is Secret Machines War. What happened in 1982 in the Soviet Union? There was a missile installation. This has been recorded. It's verified. It was so badly compromised by a UFO overflight that it might have led to World War III. This was on October 4, 1982 and an IRBM, Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Site, in the Soviet Union. But it wasn't the only one, because in Minot Air Force Base in the 1960s, something very similar happened. The UFOs overflew missile bases and kind of played games with the, with the equipment. At one point, Russia was about to launch an attack on the United States, thinking that their equipment was telling them that we had launched missiles. Now, one of our advisors, and I can identify the person, said that there were heroes on both sides of that conflict in 1982 because the base commander had his doubts and did not launch, right? He looked at the equipment. He looked at everything that was going on. He knew there was a UFO overflight taking place because everybody was looking and pointing and screaming about it, and he didn't launch. We narrowly avoided a conflict. We just managed to do it. And this advisor told us he was very sincere about it. He said there were heroes on both sides because if that base commander had ignored, had not ignored orders from the Kremlin, we might have been all radioactive material right now. So what does all this mean? The discussion and controversy over UFO phenomenon, unfortunately, is embedded in the national security discussion. Most of what we know about UFOs today was taking place at a time when the United States and Russia were at each other's throats. Everybody was truly frightened. They were scared to death about the UFO. Don't let them convince you otherwise. They didn't know what this was. They didn't know if it was a secret weapon from the other side. They didn't know if it was a third party secret weapon. There was a lot of discussion that maybe the UFOs were captured Nazi saucers. There was a lot of discussion about that. There was, that was a possibility. 
Everybody was looking at it because they came whenever they wanted to, they left whenever they wanted to. You couldn't shoot them down, you couldn't capture them, you couldn't tell them to go away. You never knew when they were gonna show up. You never knew when they were gonna leave. And they outflew anything that we had. If you're living as I grew up in the 1950s, with the air raid sirens and the drills and hide yourself under the desk and kiss your ass goodbye, if you grew up like I did during that time, you know how serious this was taken. People thought that at any moment we would be vaporized into nuclear war. This was taken for granted. We had reached that point in the 1950s. The UFO subject is inextricably connected with all of this, and that's why it's so hard now to extricate these two things. They have to be, but in 1947, Kenneth Arnold as you all know, kicked off the UFO era. He said he saw things that skipped across the sky like saucers on water, and everybody misunderstood him and thought they were flying saucers. But then you had Maury Island the same month virtually, that weird affair in which Arnold was peripherally involved, and two U.S. Air Force personnel lost their lives in an airplane crash. They were transporting what might have been metamaterials at the time. And this was followed up right away with Roswell, as we know which involved the military base and the cover-up by Major General Roger Ramey. But five years later, in 1952, Ramey was in Washington, D.C., attending a press conference called by Major General John A. Samford concerning those UFOs that flew over Washington, D.C. in July 1952. And Samford goes on the record linking these things to biblical sightings, to ESP, to telekinesis, he set the groundwork for everything we've been discussing today. He did that in 1952 and nobody paid attention. They thought he was just riffing, you know, because he didn't know what to say about the UFOs. Hill and Cotter, you all know, very famous guy, one of the pioneers in ufology, but he was former head of the CIA so that behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are really concerned, soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the UFOs are nonsense. And then Colonel Bryan reported to Donald Kehoe, you also know that name, I'm sure, the UFOs reported by competent observers are devices under intelligent control. They're either manned or under remote control or both. That's a colonel in the Air Force. In 1962, Douglas MacArthur famously said, we deal not with things of this world alone. We deal now with the ultimate conflict between a unified human race huh, and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. A unified human race. That doesn't mean unified just so we put all of our bombs together. That means unified so we pool our resources, our intellectual capital together to understand what this is. By 1960 to 69, there's the moon shot. Kennedy said, we will go to the moon in this decade. And a couple of guys called Kleins and Klein, which sounds like a law firm, but they're not. They said that space travel challenges mankind not only technologically, but also spiritually. These are two scientists. The people who developed the idea of the cyborg, saying that space travel challenges us spiritually in that it invites us to take an active part in our own biological evolution. He said that, they said that in 1960. Imagine that. And then they say again in 1961, we should use our creative intelligence to adapt ourselves to space conditions rather than taking our earth environment with us. We should adapt to what is actually there. It's suggested that such existence in space may provide a new, larger dimension for man's spirit as well. Again, the spirituality. You couldn't extricate these guys from talking about spirituality, the Bible, and all of this back in the 1950s and 1960s. They understood that this is what was happening. We've become so mechanical, though, since then. We've become so reliant upon our devices and so reliant upon technology that we're losing touch with the fact that all of these things have a spiritual dimension. All of these things are having an effect on our consciousness, and so are they. I'm not going to go and go through all of this for you, but the same guy who created the term cyborg said, you know something? There's something really funny about the human eye. It involves the lens of the eye, which he says really doesn't belong to the body. It has no blood supply going to it. 
and it sits in a liquid by itself and is therefore itself a kind of cyborgian implant. We don't consciously control the lens. There's no feedback loop between the lens and any other system. Yet the lens curves as required by our minds to see objects far away or close by. If we could tap the system that controls the lens of the eye to control something else, it would be the nearest thing to telekinesis. Kleins is saying that our eye is a cyborgian implant. And to support that, he says there's no blood supply, there's no feedback loop, it just sits there like it's been implanted, the lens of our eyes. So that brings us to the core issues. Ideas of authority, sovereignty, control, security, identity, our capabilities. Are we in charge? I've got the 10 minute warning, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Are we in charge of what's happening? Obviously we're not. Are we in charge of the UFOs? Obviously we're not. Could we be? Is there a way for us to interact more directly with the UFOs? Is it consciousness? That's the point we've been trying to make. Everything that we think of, when we think of ourselves as tribes, as members of a tribe, we think of all these ideas. But MacArthur back then, back in 62, said, a united human race is what's necessary now, a united human race, something that transcends tribes. We need to pull all of our resources from wherever we've come from, whatever our culture is. Authority, sovereignty, and the UFOs comes down to who controls the skies. No military on Earth is obviously a match for them, which our own military is now starting to admit. Their very existence is a threat to ideas about national sovereignty. Not to our natural sov national sovereignty itself, but to our ideas of what is control, who is authority, what's in charge. That top-down kind of an idea. This calls the entire political and military structure of a nation into question, right? Now what we've done is we've denied the existence of UFOs, we've ridiculed people who believes in it, we've talked about these things that way, but that was during the Cold War, when we were in, in, afraid of a nuclear conflict. No one could be sure that these things weren't from the Soviet Union. But there was the darker sentiment, the idea that the UFO might be a demonic threat that people in our Congress believed. Even Whitley Strieber, when he was being uh, hip hypnotized to recall his abduction, what does he say? Is this the devil? What the hell is this? This is a natural reaction to this. But now the Cold War is over, we know the UFOs are not made by humans, and they're certainly not flown by humans. That's all we know for sure. Is the phenomenon extraterrestrial? Is it more paranormal or supernatural? Is it something else entirely? Okay, to the stars is trying to answer these questions. We've made a lot of headway where that's concerned. But it's all about the blind men and the elephant. Why is to the stars set up that way with scientists and artists and writers and musicians and and military people and intelligence people because it's the blind men and the elephant. A bunch of blind men were told, try to tell us what an elephant is, and each blind man had one part of the elephant. So if you touch the trunk, you thought the elephant was like a big hose. That was your idea of an elephant. If you touch the tail, it was like a rope, so on and so forth. It's not just to the stars, it's all of us. The idea is that we all are blind men looking at the elephant. But if we pool our resources, if we pool the information that we each individually can contribute to this study, we will get a clearer and clearer picture of what that elephant is. No one group has the um, credibility to make these claims. No one academic discipline is capable of doing this. Science alone, the way it's structured now, will never get there. It will get very close, but it won't get there. It will need psychology, it will need anthropology, it will need everything an artistic sensibility, cultural sensibility. Music may have the key. Remember, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, music may be the language. There's all sorts of different ways we can look at this, but it's the blind men and the elephant. We're all blind men in this room. The elephant is right in the middle of the room. It's looking at us, it's waiting for us to acknowledge it. And that's all I've got to say about it. We're running out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there's questions, we only have a couple of minutes. There's a microphone right behind, right there. How do we know uh, the Roman spacecraft are not ours? Because if you're making the assumption none of these are ours. Uh, 
Hello. Yes, how do we know some of these spacecraft aren't ours? The people I've talked to are pretty sure that they're not ours because of the flight characteristics that we would love to have and we don't. We have a guy working with us right now from Skunk Works, Steve Justice. He would love if he could develop machinery like this. And he's at the cutting edge at Lockheed Martin, if, or had been. So if, if we had it, if we had that technology, we would know. What do you, what do you think of the guy, um, what's from S4, what's his name? They just did a documentary on him. Lazar, what about Bob Lazar's story? What do you make of that? I, I, I don't know. I met Bob Lazar. He seemed pretty credible to me at the time. Yes? Uh, thanks for the very interesting presentation. Just to piggyback on that, you have Ben Rich, the former CEO of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, saying that we've had this technology to uh, bring ET home for quite some number of years. Right. So do you address that in any of your work, any of, one, any of the advisors at the, uh, to the Stars Academy? By the time we get to the third volume, we're going to be addressing a lot of those issues because the third volume was held up because so much has come out in the last six to eight months that we have to include it and we have to sort of reframe some of the questions. So what's we're going to address personal, it. What's your personal opinion? Excuse me? What's your personal opinion on the matter? My opinion on? Uh, if alien reproduction vehicles and all the reports of them and the you know, eyewitness testimony. Is that a bunch of bunk? Is that a part of a limited hangout? Is that real? What's your opinion? We, we have to address the, the experiences of people who claim they have experienced these things. We're looking for common denominators. We're looking for a lot of other information like, as I said, is there genetic, have a genetic changes taken place? Has there been radiation changes taking place? All this sort of thing. It's gonna be a much larger scientific enterprise than just taking each person at face value and recording that this has actually happened. We're gonna to try to put it in a larger framework. That's a scientific approach that may not be adequate. You know, and I realize that as a person who talks to people all the time, that our approach may not be adequate, but at least it's one way to advance the ball down the field a little bit. Yes, the cargo cult is a very uh, moving metaphor. Have you considered the history of mystery science and mystery knowledge, that is, ancient initiation, as a viable approach to consciousness in the UFO phenomena? Well, I've looked at it in the first book, which is Secret Machines, Gods. We've looked at a wide range, much wider, wider than I've talked about it here, of religious attitudes towards this, and initiation is part of the things that we discuss. We could discuss that. Thanks. Yes. Do you, do you know if the, in between the consciousness studies they uh, connected gut biome with the brain as part of consciousness? Oh, the gut biome, yes. Right. I think that's mentioned in one of the books. Thank you. Sure. Um, regarding that uh, lens in the eye, uh, almost everybody ends up getting cataract surgery these days, so they're replacing that lens then. That's right. So it is a cyborg. So would you, would you have cataract surgery? Would I have it? Would you? Would you, I mean, would, <laughs> would you do it? I mean, would you replace the lens that you have, that you're I mean, born it, with, with, with whatever they're putting in Depends now? on the alternative, you know. Okay. It, I, I'm not morally opposed to it. I'm just, you know, it depends okay. on the alternative. But that, but that sounds like that original lens is pretty... Special. I wonder why. But if I lose it, if, I mean, if it's you know. But you wonder why everybody seems to have these cataracts. I mean, it's like a foreign substance. Exactly. Are we rejecting something which is basically artificial? Right. Okay. Hi, <clears throat> big fan. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. And. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you believe that the moon is a stargate and that the moonshot was a big ritual that was performed to open up the stargate? Thank you. It doesn't matter what the intention was, what happened, right? So sometimes people can do things without having the intention, but it has the effect anyway. And I think that's what happened, but it wasn't necessarily a bunch of people got together in a back room and said, we're gonna do this. Sometimes evolution and, you know, the general culture and the consciousness pushes us in a certain direction without us being aware of why we're doing this, these things. Yeah. Last one. I just want to mention, I didn't catch the name of the population, the group that's being heavily persecuted right now. Yezidi. Y-E-Z-Z? 
Y E Z I D I. E I. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. After looking at all these areas, have you come up with a hypothesis on why are they here? No, I have not. No. A lot of people have told me all sorts of things that they're very convinced one way or the other, but I have not. If they've been here since forever, it could just be we're sharing the planet with them. Thank you very much again. I have a one-minute warning. Thanks again.